So hey everybody, um, I got to go to a Tim Holtz class this past summer and I wanted to kind of take you a little bit of a run through of what was in the class, including some footage and I got Tim's permission from the class itself and some of the fun things he was talking about. And then we're going to kind of go through a little bit of some fun uh, projects and kind of where I was at with my project. Mine's below. But I'm going to take you kind of step by step as best as I can remember and with the supplies that I have, or at least I can tell you where I was at. First, this is an introduction into what Tim's class was all about and some of the him talking about some of the products that he was using in the class, specifically his mediums, um, the sizes of the stuff he's got, also talking about some of his texture paste and then his new grit paste. So let's take a look at what it was like to be in the class. Look who it is, it's Tim. We're in his artful assemblage class. Or maybe you have art that has a sense of nostalgia where you want to capture a moment. There's going to be something that maybe you'll see in a photograph or a piece of something that triggers a memory. And all of a sudden, that piece, whether you know anything or not about the people, has the sentimental value. And all of those elements, regardless of what it is, it all uses exactly the same stuff. Same ingredients, same technique. So your fixed media project is a form of whatever you're feeling at that moment. So that's why in this class, I don't want you to overthink anything. I don't want you to try to figure out the outcome and be a planner because that really does take fun out of the process, right? If you've got everything figured out, if I know where to go, you're not going to let the process take you there. And it sounds all woo, but really, it's, it is about that. It's about sometimes just kind of letting it happen. And when it's all said and done, you're going to look at it and be like, whoa, make this. For those that are familiar with distressed knitting ink patterns, that was five years of me begging for distressed knitting. And I've been with the company for 13 years, which means every meeting for five years I would say, who can do stress in the Who should do meeting stress? And I talked about this in great time. The cost of that is pennies difference than the big one. So whenever I try to get ready to do meetings, they're not a fan of that because it's still a jar, it's still a lid, it's still a label, it's still someone to fill it. But in the art world, not only is it important to have a choice of mediums, but the bigger the jar, when you use the product, what is it replaced with? Air. And that is with any product you buy. So if you don't plan on using that product within a year, don't buy it. Don't buy a big jar of something that you're not going to use it because you could buy a hundred dollar can of rock and paint, but after a year, if you use half of it, it will be dried up. It's going to happen. So when I work with mediums, I love to work with minis. So I got them to not only do all the collage mediums in mini, so there's a mini mat, mini vintage, mini crazy. Our texture paste, which we're going to use today, is also mini, a mini mat mini gloss and a mini transparent mat. And the nice thing about this, and you'll see even in my studio, this is what I work from. The next one, one of my favorites, is called Vintage. Now, if you have a close sample, that's why I made it. You really saw the color of it. What I love about Vintage is a tinted collage medium. It is tinted like antique linen. And the beauty of a tinted collage medium is that when you work with different colors of ephemera, like maybe you're going to work with bright scrap of paper and a black and white photo and a color of this. When you go over it with vintage collage medium, it brings everything together. It gives everything that uniform finish. Because some people are anchored. You know, some people have to cross over to the dark side. And they want something vintage, but they don't want it grungy. And that is the benefit of a collage medium like that. That I can brush it over the top of something, and it gives them everything that nice, harmonious tone. Now, because it is a tinted medium, the more layers of that that you apply, the darker it becomes. You so he's talking about the three different collage mediums that he has. Yeah. And we got to play with the crazing. Crazing, I don't know how close you looked at it when it came around, but crazing actually has these little fine crackles in it. I can't really call it a crackle because it isn't a crackle. It actually shatters under the surface, yet when you touch it, it's totally smooth. So I went to our chemist and I brought him an old dish and I'm like, this look is what I want. He's like, well, you want crackle? I'm like, no, I'm not crackle. I know what crackle is. Crackle is a texture. Like, you feel it, it's crackle. You can really rough over the surface. I want something that's going to crack under the surface. Like, okay. And I go, but I have to be able to add color to it. Because you got to get dirt in the cracks. I don't know how they do it on a dish, but that's what it is. Like, when you see ceramic, it's stained, brown, or whatever, but you feel it with your finger and it's completely smooth. That's really what crazy does. So the largest particle of crazing is still smaller than the biggest crackle. It's tiny, tiny, tiny. So it's never going to be this big weathered wood. That's not what crazing is. It's supposed to create these little, tiny, fine hair kind of crazing through the image. And what I love about using crazing is it never detracts from the imagery it's over the top of. 
for those of you that have ever used Rock Candy Crackle, you know exactly what I mean. If you've ever used Rock Candy over an image, when it crackles, it blurs your image. It's like trying to look through a dirty window. You can't really see the detail. Crazing, your image is exactly perfect. Tell of his mixed media, he has the matte, the vintage, and the crazing, and we're going to work with the crazing today in the class. He has this fun new product called True Grit. Oh, Grit Paste, sorry, Grit Paste. He's going to pass around these tags here in a minute about how it looks, and it's like this, it's like texture paste with little pebbly, granulated pieces in it. Is uh, this is the grit things, and he did it in a, a gradient. So this is like the crayon, and here's the ink. And he did he explain it, and I've already forgotten what all the different gradients are. But how the grit texture, and he says it's kind of like um, snow. He uses a plastic inside the grit, so it's kind of really kind of a cool texture. I'm trying to get close to this so you can see. There we go. But it really picks up pigment well. That's what he said, and it does. It really does pick it up well. Pretty fun stuff. Love that grit. So here's the supplies that we got to use for our class. We got to use a whole bunch of different distress crayons. We got uh, metallic and regular distress paints. We had a whole bunch of these vintage cards. So sorry it's so loud, everybody's here talking. This is our family member that we got to pick out and cut out. Tim scissors. We used the distress collage medium and the crazing as our main glue for everything. The texture paste for our stenciling. Some, a little stamp just for the, the words and then some black ink and then a little mini glue stick. So let me take you kind of step by step to where I got in my project. I am going to do a video where I'm going to finish this, but for now I'm just going to kind of take you to where I got in my point. First thing is, is we were each given this frame. So take a look. And of course, I've already covered my frame. This is the front side of the frame right here. Um, and basically what he did is he passed around and we all had the frame. We had this kit kind of sitting in front of us. And this is the pieces that we were able to take home. Um, he passed around a stack of papers and said, pick one. And that is the first thing that we glued down onto our board here. So from there, what we then did is we picked out pieces of ephemera from our pack and we were able to layer them around. So take a look here about where I was in the class. I took a little video of at that point. We started our collage on our MDF board that goes with that little frame over there. And let's keep on going. So we used the collage medium, we used the crazing. Crazing has this ability to make everything, and I think you saw it a second earlier, where it looks like cracked porcelain, and it's kind of done it in various sections. It tends to work a little better where it's kind of in a thicker section rather than a thinner section. So you don't want to gloop it up so it's, you know super thick but you don't want to have it just be a thin line so tends to show up best in areas where you've done it a little bit thicker so to glue the paper on you use the crazing to glue the ephemera pieces you just saw use the crazing and then you're going to cover the whole thing basically with crazing and let it dry you can use a paper towel to kind of made a ton of little baby wipes and paper towels and we we're kind of cleaning it off then we got a stencil and here is the stencil that we received and we were using the um, texture paste and opaque matte. Um, opaque meaning it's not see-through, it's going to pick up color which is what you see here. So this particular stencil only comes from when you use it with his uh, classes. So I use the found up here is right there. I use part of this, I use this piece right here, and I didn't get to clean it off really well either. I used some of the swirl right in here. I used some more down here. I did this piece in here. And so, and then I did the 19 or the one, two, three, four, I did that down here. And there's some other pieces that you really didn't see. And he kind of said, you know, hit your textures around the outside because that's what you're gonna see the most. And then we let everything dry for a while. After we went through and we did the stenciling, he said, apply the crazing again. And so we did. We went through and we applied all the crazing to everywhere again. So that way we would kind of hit over top of where we stenciled and get into some of our little nooks and crannies and do some of the crazing effects. We then took the um, distress crayons and he said, and this is what you're going to see a video of him talking about, basically said, take the distress crayons and it was for all the pieces that are underneath still and go along the edges. And you wanted to do it in like a brown color or a black or you could even do it at like a deep red or something like that. But it's going to be not a light color, but a contrasting color. So he said, go ahead and do and do all the edges, all the pieces of ephemera that are on there to make them kind of stand and pop out. Do that. But here's what he said. Okay. We are going to outline each piece of ephemera one at a time. 
Okay. Very fun way to use your crayons, use this to outline. If you're going to outline, so we go right over the edge of that piece of camera using a fairly heavy layer. So, sorry about the cutoff on Tim's video. Somebody walked behind me and started talking, and you really couldn't hear much of anything anymore. And the very beginning, he told me I could do videos, but I couldn't video the entire class. So, he, he pretty much said, do snippets. And if I sat there and videoed, I couldn't do my project. So, I had to kind of do a little bit of both. Anyway, so... What he said to do basically is you take it, you do a dark line, and then you take your finger, you take a baby wipe or a paper towel and kind of smudge it in to give it that textured grainy look. And so to give it that vintagey feel with the crayon. And he liked to use a really dark brown. So earlier you saw the tools that we had. I did buy my own, but we had some inks and stuff and some other, the crayons that were class sets that we did not get to bring home. Then he said to do is this is where you got to kind of play with your own colors. Go in and with the crayons, pick your color palette and don't do rainbow because it looks kind of funny, but pick a couple colors and I love blue. So I picked the blue tones and I picked browns. Uh, a lady next to me, uh, my friend that I went with, she went with um, pinks and reds and yellows and you'll see here hers here in a minute. And he said, go in and add color. So you took the crayon and you kind of add smudges and then you took your finger and you kind of smeared it in and you did this way. So here's a video of where my project looked after I had done that stage. And here we are playing. We just got finished playing with all the lovely distressed crayons and having fun learning and getting some inky, inky fingers. Here's my friend. Oh, that our on the way. <laughs> for hers. Right, everybody went for a different color palette. We had some fun. All right. So the next thing after we added our colors, um, we took some of the distressed paint that Tim Holtz has. Now I took mine in kind of a brown color and you put it on your craft mat and you took this special splatter brush that you can see here. So with the splatter brush and I had this really dark paint uh, that you can see here. We put it on our mat, you put this special brush, and then you flicked it. You kind of pulled the brush, and I'm sorry I don't have one to show you. It's kind of think about like a paintbrush. You pulled it like this, and see how I'm pulling the bristles like this? But because it was more like plastic pieces, it reminded me kind of of a toothbrush, but it was really long, it left this really cool splatter technique. And you could do it a little bit and get some small dots, or I did mine a ton, and I got all these really cool long splatter effects. And so I just splattered everywhere with it. So after that, you kind of let this kind of go off onto the side and you dried it. We then got to play with our letterpress words, which mine's got a little something else stuck inside of it. Let me get that out. Oh, another little ephemera piece. So you did lots and lots, of, or I did lots and lots of layers in there. And he talked about these letterpress pieces and how it took forever to try and get the right price point. Um, he really went into detail about why these pieces are the way they are and why they're priced the way they're priced and how he came up with ones that these were alphabets and he had some that were specific words, how he thought those were cool, but they really didn't sell that well. And he really kind of talked a lot about each product individually and why it is the way it is. Um, and so he said, pick out something fun, have fun with it and play with the letters. So friends, I don't want to do the words amazing, but there's only one A in the entire amazing. He said, well, think creatively, turn a letter upside down, turn it on its side, make it a Z, um, play with what could be the letters because there's some other fun ones. and There's also some numbers. So use those words, use those letters to your advantage. So for instance, the and could easily be another A and just kind of play with that. The one could be an I or an L or something along those lines. So have fun. So we then take the, the letters themselves once you figured out what word you wanted. And we took a little piece of paint and we just kind of put a smear of paint on our on our table. And it was in kind of this grayish color. Um, you needed to pick a light color because if it was too dark, you wouldn't see it against the, the word colors themselves. You could easily leave them plain, but he was just showing a fun way to kind of distress and add more fun to it. So you put this piece of paint on there, you blotted it down, you heat set them a little bit, and then you took a little piece of sandpaper and you scuffed it up and that way you distressed it. So here you can see that there's paint on there. And then the second thing we did, and you can tell the paint is not fully on the letters themselves. The next thing we did is we took a stamp and he says any word stamp would do. Anything that looks like it's got a bunch of letters on it, lots of phrases, it doesn't have to be in English, it can be anything you want. And we just took the black ink and we stamped over top to give it the letters on top. So it's just kind of distressed it and added a fun effect to it. So he then said, now put that aside. And then we went back to our main um, thing. And at this point, we went to the frame itself. So with our frame, the first thing we did is we took some of the metallic paints, like you see here. 
and he had a couple of different metallic paints. There was a silver, um, I just showed you one of them, and there's also a brass. And I did a little bit of both because I like the colors of both the silver and the um, gold tones. It kind of really went well with both colors I was working with here. And he said, go ahead and paint it and just do a light coat going all the way around with both colors. Let that dry, let that kind of air dry. You could heat set it too. And he says, then go back with your crayons and do a dark color and kind of hit some areas and really get in with your fingers and really kind of, you know, smooth it in and get some fun dark tones that's where this black tone so here you can see there's some darker tones and lighter tones and then I have some silvers and I have some of those brass tones in there that's how they're all getting in and every all those little nooks and crannies inside of here really kind of get in there and stick well the other thing he was commenting on because this frame ends up going on there look how much is actually all this edge is getting covered up so if you did, for instance, when I did this stencil, I should have done this a little bit further up here because you're not seeing those little corners. They're getting covered up quite a bit. And so that's why he said, don't worry about if your paper is completely perfect on the edge. Don't worry about getting all the way in the corner. You're not gonna see that stuff. So just be careful about where you're placing your items. He also said from the very beginning, because you think we're doing layer upon layer upon layer. If you really like that piece of ephemera, for instance, if you really like that number five, don't put that as one of your bottom pieces because the chance is it's gonna get covered up. The whole point of all these layers is to give you tons of textures and depth, and there's really no right or wrong reason to this. It's the final steps that I haven't done yet that really kind of make your project your project. Everything up to this point, it's just kind of fluff, and it just adds to the layers of it. Now, he did say that he uses his uh, collage medium for everything, and he said, take some collage medium, go around the outside, and then stick your frame, it'll stick your frame to there. I personally am not a fan of that because I like it to stick faster and because in this particular situation with the class we were leaving and I had no good way to make sure that this stayed in a nice firm like I would normally put clips on it or something to make sure that it stayed and it stayed to a point but as you I've been able to rip it off since then even though I applied the glue and you can see it was in there it's come right off. So unless I had, you know, I was in my house or something and I was able to put the collage medium on there, stick the frame, stick a book on it to make sure it's set nice and firm and I put enough on there and let, went away for 24 hours, I probably would not use this. I would probably go back to my beacon glue for frame, you know, gluing this on here because I'd be afraid it would fall off over time. I, I, I wasn't too comfortable. For layering papers, I thought this was great. I, I really did think this was a really good thing and I liked the fact that it was doing this funny crackle thing in there. That was cool. So after we did the frame, he said to go ahead and glue this down. I really didn't do that. And he said, you know, put the crayon on. And then we did the foil on the edges here. You could pick out either gold or silver. It was kind of up to you. It really didn't matter which way you went. Um, it really depended on which path you were taking. He said certain colors are well with golds. If you were doing yellows and pinks, gold looks really good. If you were doing blues and stuff, um, silver looks good. It also depends on what color you painted your frame. And I did a little bit of both. And so I asked if I could have both colors. He goes, yeah, sure why not so it just adds a really light kind of um sheen of color just a really kind of glimmer and basically what you do is you take a cheap old glue stick he had his own brand but he said you could use whatever you put a little bit of glue on don't overdo it kind of smear it in and then you take your foil and you stick it on and you just kind of stick it on to where you put the glue and then you let it sit and he goes you want to at least let it sit five minutes, but 10 to 15 is even better. So it's something that you have to maybe step away from or move this aside and work on something else, which is what we did. He said, glue this on and stick them in a few different spots. And he gave us about four or five. And so you could put your glue on different spots and then push this aside and let it dry for a while. We worked on the next step. So the next step that we did after that is we went through and we picked out some more ephemera pieces. And this was closer to the top layers that you're dealing with. And he said, this is where you want to kind of add some layers. And then he passed around and we had a set of cards for that we shared between three to four people. And it's what he called his found relatives. And oops, all these little cards, what he did is he went around and he found old family pictures. Um, some of them, I think this one was actually from his family. Um, or maybe it was a, a, a close friend's family. It was one little boys. He actually knew one little boys was his uncle or something like that. All the other found relatives were pictures that he found at garage sales that people were just getting rid of old photos. And so he turned them into cards. And so he put a really pretty image on the back. So they look like playing cards. And I actually took two of them and transposed them on the back side because I like the images and then put some more ephemera pieces. I wanted something larger for the back of this. His idea is to cut the little people out 
And then I was going to have him sitting kind of like this right here. I wasn't really sure how I was placing it. This is why I kind of stopped at this point. Number one, because we were running out of time. And number two, because I wasn't really sure I wanted to use this piece. Um, I had thought because I have, you know, to put my own children on here. So it made it more personal versus just putting three kids. I have no clue who they are and they mean nothing to me. He says he likes putting just random because he likes to play and he's more about the process than he is about the personal picture and the picture itself could mean something else to you maybe the fact that they're kids and they're dressed up as cowboys reminds you of something um to each their own that's not really my thing i, I think i'd rather go for more um me especially if i'm going to put this up in my house and frame it but if this was just some generic artwork then yeah you could use whatever stock photo image his found relatives whatever it may be so he said to cut this out and do your best and then take some of the distressed crayons and then use his little foam dots to kind of pop it up so that way it wasn't just sitting there. I'm also not a huge fan. I think it on some projects it looks fantastic, but I personally don't like the cut out of the people. It makes it feel like they're just kind of floating in air. So when I pick my picture, I'm probably going to pick it because I like the background. There's a reason why we took a picture in that location at that time. It means something and it tells me more. It's not just the people. So again, that's a personal aesthetic with me. So it's just something different. He likes to cut all of his objects out and do funny things with them and make them look like they're, you know, got party hats on. And, you know, that's definitely his aesthetic. You know, make it look like they're sitting on an object or standing on a thing. Or to me, it just looks a little odd. It's not my style. But like I said, everybody's a little bit different. And as I go through and add more layers and finish this, I might add more foil as time goes along. Um, I actually let a couple pieces sit. That's why this is so brilliant. And there's a couple pieces on here, right here, that I put the glue on and I let the foil sit and then I haven't removed it um, since then. And that's been a couple, probably three months. It's done fine. So at this point, what basically you were gonna do is you could take any of your ephemera pieces, you could take all these fun little pieces here, you know, you could take some of these fun little pieces, this metal bits and you know, all of these, and there is some gems, and this is where you take your words and you figure out where you're gonna put your words. Um, you know, I had used the words amazing. Oops. So this is where I kind of got stuck and this is where I needed to come home and finish. I didn't, I wanted to put my own picture on there and the lady next to me kind of had the same thing. She goes, I have this image in my head of my father that would be perfect for this particular project. And so you can kind of imagine where I was going to go with this. So here's where the frame is. And so you do kind of want to put your frame down because you don't want to start placing things that are going to fit off your frame. So he said, go ahead and glue when you get to this point before you start putting your finishing touches on. And so you don't want to also have your image, whatever your final key point image. And usually and for this, it's a person um, or a group of people. And you don't want to have them floating. For instance, I don't just want to have this hanging out down here, like right there. What are they standing on? You could have them resting on one of the cards. You could have them resting on top of your phrase. Um, he says, but you need to have some sort of anchor for your people. So if you take a look at his, um, this one looks like he's sitting on top of the card souvenirs, like he's popping out of a box. This one, he said he had a really hard time with these girls. They're actually orientated the other way. She is on this side. So what he did is he cut both girls out and he placed her like she was sitting on there and then her like she was standing behind. So the box is supporting both girls. He said the way that they had it before, she it just looked like she was floating in midair. Now they're both anchored. For her, um, it looks like she's standing on top of the box and same thing for him. Him and the the boy and the dog or the man and the dog or look like they're standing on top of this and then you have the arrow kind of standing in between. He said this is where you get kind of nitpicky. At this point where you start layering all these little bits and pieces of people um, on top of all these layers, this is where it kind of seals in your deal and you add the final touches like putting the 73 in his little top hat on there. Um, the title of it and in those last little bits of things on this is really where it kind of brings it all together and makes it shine and so that's where i'm kind of stuck this is the point where you really have to kind of take it to the next level and solidify your feel do you want to have something else coming out do i want to have a little something right in here and maybe that's also why i didn't want to completely glue this down because what if i want to tuck one more thing underneath so it's not floating 
you know, and I just, I need to play is the bottom line and get in here and decide. And I know I'm not using this, so I need to find the photo I want to use. So that was our class. He was super sweet every throughout the entire class. Um, he would stop from his main lecture at the front and he would walk around and I think he sat, talked to each person, whether it be, oh, I like those cool colors or, oh, I love that technique or that's a really nice idea or I like how you blended this and that. He had a nice thing to say about every single person in the room and he did make sure he walked around to every person at least two to three times, I would have to say, and the class was about two hours long, maybe two and a half hours, um, but it went by like lickety split. It was so fast, but it was great. Um, he also talked about how you could take um, these resin pieces here. So this is just a little resin flower and how you could take the crayons and color them and they would coat onto there as well. Um, and how it would kind of change the color that you could take even this piece and coat it and give it a distress feel so it wasn't so red. I didn't really like specifically the red colors on these and how you can distress this too because I was going for a bluey theme but you know it doesn't they kind of make those items pop so that's why you have to be so careful about where you're placing them because it really is going to kind of stand out on you. So I also wanted to maybe add a few fun things from my house to this fun idea. So. I had a blast. It was super fun. I went with my friend Julia and we had, we were glued to what was going on. I was trying to juggle taking pictures and then, you know, doing other fun stuff. And as he was talking about what products he was using, we had a little card. My number was 24 and you held it up. So you didn't have to jot down or remember, Oh, I really want to buy that item. You held up your number and they went and got it for you and stuck it in a bag. And you just went to the register at the end and all your stuff was waiting there for you. It was really kind of fun. So if you wanted more of these letters, you wanted more of their whatever, you didn't have to remember it. So the store made a lot of money that day too, I'm sure. And it was really good. So thanks for stopping by. I am going to have a video of me finishing this. It'll be kind of like a part two to Tim Holtz class where I'm going to completely finish my project. So let's go back to the class that we actually had. Tim's going to take some, some final words and let's see what the aftermath of the class looks like. Now you've got something finished. Oh, yeah. You've got something finished that you can take home. You can set it on a shelf. You can do whatever you want with it. But what I like about these frame panels as well is you can also display it. So. This adjustable easel is something I come up with to display work. So we're in the after effects of the class and there's Tim up there saying goodbye and kind of walking around and talking to people and discussing all that and doing little photo selfies and things. So here's the end. Thanks for stopping by. Goodbye. Welcome to my 1500 giveaway. I'm giving away four different Bridges from Road mini chalk ink sets to lucky winners who subscribe to my channel. All I need you to do is go to the video linked here, which is my Brutus Monroe Ink Lab. Go in the top corner and hit the I button. It'll take you directly to that video. And then just leave a comment that you would like to win. And if you're a new subscriber, please say that. Or if you're a returning subscriber, well, let me know. That's it. Thanks so much. Bye.